This morning we're starting a brand new series that we're calling I Love My Church, and we're going to be celebrating and talking about the church. God loves the church. We, we get to be a part of the church worldwide, but also a part of a local church. God loves the church worldwide. God loves this church. God loves this church. He, he, gave, he gave his son to die on behalf of the church. It's through the, it's through the local church that God accomplishes his will on the earth. It's through the local church just like last weekend. It's through the local church that God is rescuing people from the fire of hell, like it says in the book of Jude, snatching people out of the flames of hell and bringing them to salvation. Jesus laid down his life on behalf of the church. So if God sees the church as something so lovely, something, something to adore in such a way, then it's a good idea for us to align our hearts and our attitudes with his, amen? Because it's, it's really easy for people to talk bad about the church, to badmouth the church, even Christians, to complain about the church, to judge, to criticize, to just generally devalue the church by the way that they talk about it or by the way that they behave towards it. It's a mistake to devalue and to treat the church as something less than what it is because the church, we are the bride of Christ, the Bible says. The bride of Christ. This isn't just a human organization, a get-together. We are the bride of Christ. I don't know of any man who would take kindly to somebody criticizing his fiance to talk about how dumb she is, how ugly she is, how she can't do anything right. Really, I don't know of anyone that would just sit, nod in agreement and be okay with that. I mean, you're going to get hit in the face, right, if you start talking about... But that... That's the way that people talk about the church, and essentially it is Jesus' fiancé. The, the Bible says that we are, we are the body of Christ. I, I, was at, I was at the VA pool yesterday. It was crowded at the VA pool, and when you are at the VA pool on a crowded day, there are plenty of opportunities, if you wanted them, to criticize people's bodies, right? <laughs> I didn't, but I could have. But if you saw me at the VA pool... Let's say I found someone overweight, and I went over to them, and I was just poking their belly with my finger, saying, what, what's going on here? This is, you know, you're welcome to wear a T-shirt. You don't have to go topless. You don't have to subject the rest of us to what, right? You, you would say, that guy is an absolute jerk, and you'd be right. I, I shouldn't, it's, it's, it's rude on any level to criticize somebody's body, and that might be a silly example, but that's the very thing we do when we are harsh and speak judgmentally towards the body of, we're talking about Jesus' body, and if it's something you think, well, that's out of line to do to a complete stranger, why do so many people find great comfort in doing it to Jesus himself? We are the body of Christ. It is a bad idea to tear down and put down what Jesus gave his life to build up and lift up. So we're taking this series to, to Talk about, look at what exactly the church is, and to celebrate the church as the body of Christ. That's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to look at the book of Ephesians for the next number of weeks and use that as kind of a, a launching point for this series. We're celebrating and learning about the church. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, it says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Paul is writing a letter to the church at Ephesus. That's what this letter is. And he's encouraging them, helping them to understand who they are as the body of Christ 
And so we're going to do the same thing looking at some of the teaching he gave them. And he, he gives us this prayer. He is praying for the church. And in verse 18, part of what he is praying, and really it's, it's the word of God, so it's the spirit of God writing through Paul. So this is the prayer or the cry of the spirit of, of God, what he desires for the church. Verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you could know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? He wants our eyes to be open. He wants their, our hearts to be flooded with light, our hearts to be enlightened, that we would be able to see, that we would be able to understand. Understand what? Well, he starts talking about all that God has in the saints, the greatness of his power for us who believe. Well, who, who are the believers? Who are the saints? He's talking about the church, right? He's talking about the church having a greater understanding of just how significant they are as men and women of God as the church of Jesus Christ. Very similar to what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16, he says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, he writes something very similar to this a couple of chapters later in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. At that time, he's talking about people as individuals being the temple of God. But in this portion, he's talking about the church collectively. Don't you know? Don't you know that when you get together, it is a unique atmosphere? That the church, when it means the assembling together, when we come together it, like, like we are this morning... We are the temple of God, the dwelling place for God's spirit. In fact, he says that you are holy, that the temple of God is holy. Holy means it's beyond just not smoking cigarettes and getting drunk. That's not all that holy means. It means set apart. It means that it's different. There's nothing like it. So he is saying that the church is holy. This is a unique atmosphere. Again, it's not, this isn't like the Elks Lodge or something like that. Where this isn't just a get-together for believers. When the, the body of Christ assembles, it is a unique atmosphere unlike anything else on the face of the earth. And it's important for us to understand that. Because until you understand the significance of where you are, you'll never really be able to benefit from being there. You'll never be able to put a draw on what's available if you don't appreciate where you are. So we can shuffle in and out of here on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis for some of you. Nudge, nudge, little shot at you there. And never really understand, you're not just coming in and out of a building. You're not just getting together with some other people that happen to like this book too. You are entering into the temple of God. Don't you know? That's why Paul's saying, don't you know? You've got to understand. Let their hearts be enlightened. Let their eyes come open. The, the power of God that's available in the assembling of God's saints. Until you understand where you are, you'll never be able to take advantage of where you are. In the 90s, there was a, a craze on, on, on Beanie Babies. Anybody remember that? A couple of you? Every, every once in a while, there's you know, a toy that people just go crazy for, and it, it, you know, it, all of a sudden it's in short supply, and people you know, pay ridiculous prices. Well, that, it was the Beanie Babies in the mid to late 90s. I was in college at the time in Springfield, Missouri, and I remember one day I was walking through the mall there, and I saw a table loaded with Beanie Babies, and they had boxes of them, and they were just piling them on this table out in front of a store. And I saw people taking the Beanie Babies and just walking away. So I, I said, what's going on here? And they said, well, we're, we're, just, we're, we're just giving these Beanie Babies away. They're free. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm an 18 or 19-year-old college student, so I'm really not into stuffed animals at that point in my life. Not that there's ever been a point in my life that I was into stuffed animals, but especially not then. But I'm a college student, so I am into free things. So I, I got a bag, and I loaded that bag full of Beanie Babies, and I'm walking around the mall with a bunch of Beanie Babies. In fact, I went to the food court, and someone tried to steal, tried to steal my Beanie Babies. <laughs> which It's very emasculating to try to defend your Beanie Babies. A... <laughs> no, that's my bag of Beanie Babies. Keep your hands off of it. But there were people that wanted those. 
to the point where they were willing to steal them, people that were going without, and they didn't understand. That, listen, they're giving them away. They're, they're available, but they went without because they didn't understand the significance of where they were, the building that they were in. They were available for free. Now, it's a ridiculous example, but something similar happens in the house of God, in the body of Christ, in the church that people don't understand the significance of what is available, the uniqueness of the atmosphere that you're in right now, so people can come in and go out and do without all that's available in the presence of God. It is holy. This is a special environment, again, unlike anything else on the planet. And as we learn to understand that more, our expectation goes up, what we receive increases, because we start to understand, listen, th this is an atmosphere where you can put a draw on all that's available in the Lord. In fact, let me read you from Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 22. It says this, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now he's listing a bunch of different places, it sounds like. He says, you have come to, and then starts to say all these different things. But this isn't like Johnny Cash's I've Been Everywhere, man. He's not just naming a bunch of random spots. He is describing one place. He says, you've come to Mount Zion. And then he starts to clarify what it is. He's writing to believers. When we've come into relationship with Jesus, when we come into the fellowship, in fact, he even describes it to the general assembly, the church. He equates the church, the assembling of God's saints, to Mount Zion. And when we begin to understand that, you can look at different prophecies throughout the Bible, the significance of Zion. The, the assembly of the saints is in a, a very real way Mount Zion. Even in the Old Testament, Mount Zion would, moved. First it was the old city of David, and then they built the temple up on the temple mount, and that's where God's presence was. And so now, all of a sudden, that, that, that's Mount Zion. That's the place of God's presence. Well, where's God's presence now? We just read, don't you know that you are the temple of God? You are where the Spirit dwells, that it's holy unto God, that we are Mount Zion. Not, not us as individuals, but the assembling of the saints. And then you can begin to see the power that is in Zion. Let me read a couple of passages to you. You can begin to see the significance of where we are right now. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 17 says, but on Mount Zion there shall be. So you can see this is even prophetic in the Old Testament. There shall be. It's pointing towards it. But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. What, what's it saying? That the church is a place of deliverance. The church is an atmosphere that allows people to step into freedom unlike any other atmosphere or environment. The church is a place for people to grow and advance in holiness. The church is a place for people to possess their possessions, to, to take what rightfully belongs to them. That that's what the church, God has set up the church to function as Mount Zion. In fact, the, the last series we did is a perfect example of that. People beginning to possess their possessions. We talked about healing. We've had more testimonies over the last two or three weeks than really at any other time that I can remember of people receiving their healing. Why? B because we taught about healing and taught about how it belongs to people who are children of God. It's already been paid for. And so what happens is people begin to possess their possessions. That's what God set up the church to be. It's a place of freedom, a place of growth, a place of development. Believers need to grow. Believers need to develop. They need to take steps forward. And God has set up the church as the place where, where that, that happens, where you can receive instruction, where you can receive enlightenment. Listen to what it says in Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm. It's talking about Jesus and what Jesus was going to accomplish and talking about his ministry. Verse 2 says this, The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength 
Where's this rod of strength going to come from? It's going to come out of Zion. How does God accomplish his will today? Where does God's strength, where is it put on display? How are the enemies of the kingdom of God subjected? Where, where does that come from? It comes from the body of Christ, out of the church. That God will send forth the strength of Jesus, his, the rod of strength, out of Zion. That the church is a place for people to receive strength. When you separate yourself from church, when you separate yourself from the body of Christ, you're, you're missing out on where you're supposed to receive freedom and instruction and grow stronger in the Lord. And the enemy deceives so many people and keeps them from receiving all the benefits of being a plugged in, planted member of the house of God. So people will work all week and then decide that they're too tired to go to church. You know what, I had a hard week, I had a bad week, I worked six days straight, you know what, I'm just gonna take today and rest and they don't realize that they're forfeiting going to the very place where they're gonna receive the strength to make sure next week wasn't like last week. It's a place where God sends forth his strength. You're supposed to come into the house of God and receive the nourishment and the strength to go out there and to rule in the midst of God's enemies. A place where you receive revelation, understanding, a fresh infilling of God's whole Holy Spirit to be built up so that when you leave this place, you go out of here to rule and to dominate the enemies of God. But when people skip the step of being in the house of God, they also skip the step of being a strong man or woman of God, and they become just like everyone else. But that's not how we're supposed to be. We're sons and daughters of God, and we're supposed to come into Zion to find deliverance and holiness, to learn how to possess our possessions, to learn how to exercise and walk in the strength of God. Don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? But you get an idea for just how special this is. If anyone defiles the temple of God, what's he talking about? He's talking about the community of believers. He's writing that to the Corinthian church and to the the church here today. If anyone defiles the temple of God, it says God will destroy him. This is, this is an atmosphere, an environment that is to be cherished and protected. You see that throughout the New Testament. Titus chapter 3 verse 10 says, If people are causing divisions among you, be merciful and just let it go. They don't understand. Just keep loving them in the name of the Lord. No, that's not what it says. If they're causing, if they're causing divisions among you, if they're stirring up trouble in the church, give them a first and a second warning, after that, have nothing more to do with them. God wants his church protected from anyone that would try to stir up division and trouble. It's to not to be tolerated in the body of Christ. Why? Because this is holy. This is not just a get-together. This isn't people just checking in at this building once a week or twice a week. This is special. It is an environment that is unlike anything else. We're the... the the body of the living Lord Jesus. Back to Ephesians. Jump down to verse 22. It says, And he put all things under his feet, talking about Jesus. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Jesus is the head of the church, which speaks of a connection. It speaks of unity. But it says that God put all things under his feet and then gave him to the church. That Jesus is a gift to the church. And it starts to break down an understanding of what the church is. Gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. Then it gives a fuller explanation. The church, which is the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is the body of Christ. What else is it? Well, it's the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is the fullness of Jesus. 
That's why when we understand this as, you know, hey, we're just a bunch of sinners that get together once in a while, once a week or so to encourage each other, that, that's nonsense. We are the fullness of him who fills all in all. And we've got to begin to see ourselves as that and believe that God's word knows what it's talking about when it gives a description of who we are. We are the fullness of him who fills all in all. That word in the Greek speaks of like a receptacle or a container that you can fill up. We are the fullness. We are a place that God has decided to put the fullness of him who fills all in all. I've got a, I've got a pet peeve when people give you a drink and they give you a cup and the cup is only like half full. That, that irritates me. Unless you're giving the drink to like a, a two-year-old child. F fill the thing up or pick a different cup. The cup is that size for a reason. Go ahead and use it to its full potential. That cup has more potential, right, to reach its fullness. What does fullness mean? For a cup, for a container, for a receptacle, it means reaching its full potential, going all the way, that there is no lack. That's what it's speaking of, the body of Christ. It is the fullness. The fullness of who? Jesus knows how to fill something up. He's not going to give you something half full. He's the one who fills all in all. He, he's all in. When he fills up, he fills it. He's all in. He's the one who fills all in all. And we are to be the fullness of him who fills all in all. That, that's how the Bible describes the body of Christ. That we've been given. Jesus is our head. Our head has everything under his feet. Our head has all power and all authority. Our head who we're connected to and he was given to us. We are his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. That's why when the Bible gives instruction to be in church, to be a part of the church, that's not just to give us a religious exercise to participate in. When you begin to understand that this is the fullness, you can never reach your potential outside of being a part of the body of Christ. You'll never be the man or the woman you've been called to be until you're fully engaged in the body of Christ. It's the fullness. It's where you find fullness. The fullness of him who fills all in all. So when the Bible talks about making sure you're in church, it's not just to give you an extra chore to do that week. It's because God loves you. He loves you. He wants you to come into a center of deliverance, a center of healing, a center of receiving fresh strength. In fact, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 25 says this, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Let us not neglect our meeting together. Let us not neglect our meeting together. What does it mean to neglect our meeting together? Don't neglect it. What does neglect mean? When I was in school, one time I had a teacher write a letter to my parents concerning my behavior and gave it to me to give to my parents. I, right, right. I neglected to give that letter to my parents. What does that mean? I neglected to do it. What's that mean? I, I, I didn't do it. I didn't give him the letter. So when he says, let us not neglect our meeting together, don't, don't not meet together. Or you could say it the other way, make sure that you're meeting together. When the, when the church is meeting, make sure that you are a part of it. Don't not go when the church is meeting together. Be there. Be a part of it. Don't neglect our meeting together. And the, what's interesting about this passage of Scripture it's unique in a sense that it, it was true when it was written 2,000 years ago or so. It, there was application, but as time has gone on, this particular verse that we just read has increased in its application because he says, especially or all the more, increasingly so as you approach the day of the Lord's return. The closer we get to the Lord's return, this passage of Scripture says, listen, th this is going to continue to become more true, more applicable, more important. The closer you get to Jesus coming back, and Jesus is coming back soon. 
We are as close as anyone has ever been, so this passage of Scripture applies to you and I more than it has ever applied to any group of believers. Don't neglect meeting together, especially all the more as you get close to the day that Jesus is going to come back. God is doing things in these final days and is going to continue to do things. Now, I don't claim to fully understand all that it is, but this passage gives us enough information that you are making a mistake to be outside of the church in these last days, in the final hours. To separate yourself from the church is to separate yourself from the move of God that is happening and is going to happen. Thank you so much for watching Brand New You. Before we let you go, we want to give you an opportunity to ask Jesus into your heart. If you would like to make that decision today, simply repeat this prayer after me with your heart and your lips out loud. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me new. Jesus, I believe that you died for me and you are coming back again for me. I love you and I give my life to you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the first time today, we want to congratulate you. And we want to encourage you to visit brandnewyou.cc and click the I Just Got Saved tab. This way, we can follow up with you and send you a free gift in the mail. For more information on Center Branch Church or the Brand New You broadcast, please visit brandnewyou.cc. Here, you can respond in multiple ways. Let us know if you made a commitment to follow Christ while watching, or if you have any comments, questions, or concerns. You can also email your responses and prayer requests to info at brandnewyou.cc. Another great way to keep in touch with our ministries is to download the Center Branch app. Here you can read your Bible, take notes, listen to podcasts, and much more. The Center Branch app is available on all platforms. Download it today for free. If you would like to partner with us financially at Brand New You, simply visit brandnewyou.cc and click the Giving tab. There, you can follow the step-by-step instructions to make your donation. Or you can text to give by texting brand new and the amount to 59769. You just finished watching a portion of our series called The Children's Bread. One of the main points we talk about in this series is how important faith is in receiving and keeping your healing. Now we know that the Word of God says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we have made a CD series available for you to get this in your spirit. You can receive this series two ways. The first is by going to brandnewyou.cc and visiting our product page. This way you can purchase that CD there. The second is by going to the giving tab and making a donation of any amount. And we'll send this to you for free. Thanks for watching and may God richly bless you.